Hey everybody, hope you guys are doing well. Um, not going to say a lot at the beginning here, but this is the first kind of video lecture reading guide um, that I am recording for our class. So I'm excited to get to it. Let me tell you about the plan for this video. I'm going to first give an overview of modernism. So we're moving from the 19th century to the 20th century. So we're moving away from the movements that we were talking about, movements in realism and um, movements like uh, naturalism, regionalism, that kind of stuff. We're moving now to something called modernism. So as you can see on the screen here, um, I'll be talking about modernism um, introducing that artistic and literary movement. And then I'm going to introduce you to William Carlos Williams. So William Carlos Williams is our reading for Tuesday, March 24th. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the biography, but you should still be reading the biographies. And if you don't have your book, I can help find one for you. Um, and then mostly kind of ways to engage his work. So important ideas, important ideas to his kind of project as a poet. And then um, I'm going to give you some entry points to the three poems. So ways to dig deeper. I'll, I'll be doing some kind of a little bit of readings while I'm suggesting that. So I hope this, po this video is not too long. Um, but I am going to try to accomplish a lot here. So this modernism introduction will be going for the next, this um, is introducing us to ideas that we'll be talking about for the next several weeks, basically until we get to a raisin in the sun. We'll be in the literary movement of modernism. So this is, these are important ideas and I want us to spend a little bit of time thinking about um, what was happening historically, what was happening culturally that shifted into this um, literary artistic movement. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so I begin here with, and let me move my, vid, my picture there just so we can see the whole quote. Um, so this is a quote from a scholar named Linda Lavelle. She says, I regard modernism as an interdisciplinary phenomenon of the early 20th century. So it's an interdisciplinary phenomenon. So it's happening across all different kinds of arts, um, even things like architecture, painting, literature, um, different kinds of literature, poetry, prose, drama. Um, but this is the important part, and this is going to be how I'm framing our understanding of modernism. So she says, but, but I see it at, but she sees it as a common set of problems rather than a common set of solutions. So oftentimes modernism is kind of defined in, in what, in um, ways that authors are connected in terms of like the themes that they use or the techniques. Um, I like thinking this thinking about it in this way. So what does this mean that it's a common set of problems rather than a common set of solutions? Um, it means that not all modernists are doing the same thing. And actually, and I'll talk about this later a little bit when I talk about modernist poetry, but actually all modernists kind of have their own project. They do kind of group up together in different ways, but um, a modernist painter is going to be doing something really individual, even from another modernist painter. A uh, modernist poet like William Carlos Williams is, is going to be quite different than, say, a modernist like Marianne Moore or a modernist like T.S. Eliot or uh, Wallace Stevens. So, but what they're responding to, what they are um, kind of moving out of is the same cultural context, the same set of problems, the same set of questions, so they're responding to these same things. So let me talk about what those are. What are these problems or what are these things that are happening that the um, modernist artists, specifically the poets today, are responding to? Okay, so modernism in context. So let me talk a little bit just about the historical context. Um, so what is modernism? So modernism is a literary 
an artistic movement that responds to widespread and far-reaching changes in Western society in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So we all are probably pretty aware of all the kind of changes that are happening in industrialization and um, in things like urban development, rise of cities, and the development of technologies that happened at the end of the 19th century. So the end of the 1800s, moving into the 1900s. Lots of things were changing. I'll talk about some specific things in a minute, but really the important idea is like changing technologies, the rise of cities, um, and then philosophically some interesting things were happening because of some like new scientific ideas, new scientific theories, somebody like Einstein or someone like Freud, these people developing new theories mean that we no longer trust in the same kind of ideals that the Enlightenment gave us. So rejection of certain of, of the certainty of Enlightenment thinking. So this belief in pure objective knowledge and the idea that humans can, um, can access knowledge objectively, that's something that has that people are now questioning because of the variety of new scientific ideas that are developing. Um, another really important historical thing is World War One. So World War One is really, in most people's minds, the first world world war, the first war where across all nations, um, all nations were affected in some way. So this is really disruptive force for um, cultures, uh, the American culture we're focusing on because we're in American literature, for, um, but also this is the war that's really using new technologies in really destructive ways, okay? So um, we'll think about that too. So in the, the kind of new age, the, the idea of newness and also these kind of disruptive things that are occurring, um, people, individuals saw traditional forms as no longer working. So this is a new world, a new modern world, the traditional forms um, of religion, of science, of belief, of the uh, et cetera, et cetera, they don't do not longer no no longer work. Um, the same goes for artistic expression. So the ways we've been expressing ourselves artist artistically don't work either. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, so urban life. Uh, as you can see, there's a picture over here of a skyscraper. This is considered the first skyscraper. Um, so that's just an uh, embodiment of something that is important in, in modernism, and that's the rise of cities. So um, between 1870 and 1920, 11 million people migrated from rural to urban areas in the United States, and then also 25 million immigrants came to the U.S. and mostly lived in urban settings. So that's um, th this is a really important idea here is that there's this major influx of individuals into cities um, in, in this like in age of industrial progress and industrial development. Um, clearly, this is going to affect a lot of ways of thinking. Uh, so what does that bring? Well, on the positive end, there's a sense of multiplicity and dynamism. So this idea of um, multiple new ideas coming together in the same place. So in a, an apartment in New York City, you could have people from different artistic movements, people from... Uh, espousing different philosophical ideas, kind of bouncing ag against each other. I mean, different cultures, right? If we think about all the immigrants that were living in a place like New York City. So new ideas colliding, bringing this kind of new energy to the city. <clears throat> also diversity, diversity of thinking, diversity um, in a variety of ways. So there's this all this energy that happens um, in the city through this kind of understanding of multiplicity and the, the energy, the dyna dynamism that comes with that. At the same time, there's also a sense or feeling of an anarchy and chaos. So there's a sense of losing control over the human experience. Um, I think we can, you know, this, this would happen in, in multiple ways. First of all, like as industrialization happens, or, or begins to develop on an even wider scale, mass production, these kind of things, we become 
more like cogs in a machine um, is how people were understanding it in some ways. Um, so thinking about modernist artists, they were both excited about the possibilities that the city brings. So like all the kind of cultural movement and ideas swirling around in one kind of small place. But at the same time, they were concerned about the, the chaos that this also could bring. So there's a both and happening here. And then lastly, just thinking about urban life. I, I like to think about modernism in terms of perception. So how is this shaping the way we think and see and etc. So new ways of seeing and moving, right? Skyscrapers are giving you, a, literally giving you a new way to see the city, to see people, right? Um, <clears throat> cars, subways, you're literally moving at a faster pace. Um, so the, the things, the developments happening in the city are affecting the way we experience a city right? The way we experience each other. Okay. So that's urban life. Um, so just so you can see the full title here, technology and its discontent. So kind of along with this idea of the rise of cities, we see development of new technologies. Um, so what are these new technologies, new tools, new methods, things like electricity begins being used on a, a wider a widespread basis, um, faster methods of transportation, the x-ray, um, radio, the way we're communicating is changing. So there's a spirit of optimism really in some ways toward industrialization and new technologies at the turn of the century. And one um, embodiment of this is the World's Fair in Chicago in 1893, which um, showcase kind of new technological, new tools, new technological tools and advancements in a museum like setting. So we are, we have this sense of optimism at the turn of the century and this sense of like new lights and the way we experience um, each other is changed literally by how things are lit in different ways. Think of a place like Times Square, um, what that would have looked like before electricity and after. Okay, so World War I, again, here we keep thinking about World War I, we, we should think about it as a disruptive force. So World War I and other disasters force people to question new technological advancements. So um, technology allowed for a wider scale of destruction during something like World War I. So that begins, uh, begins to force us to think about kind of, are all of these things good? Um, also, people are losing jobs um, because we're getting something like an adding machine. So we don't need somebody to uh, do the math anymore because there it can just occur on something like an adding machine or a calculator, right? So um, there's actually a play called The Adding Machine about this. So people are worried about becoming machine-like as we are becoming more of a machine-like culture at the, at this point in time. Okay, so technology is another major kind of thing in uh, modernism. And new ways of seeing. So I kind of talked about this when we were talking about like cars and skyscrapers, but um, this gets a little bit more at like the philosophical side of that. So thinking about new ways of seeing. So there's scientific theories that undercut cut belief in objective knowledge. So there is this um, belief in empiricism in the 19th century in terms of, and we see this in like something like realism, this idea that humans can see something and access knowledge from that. Um, so that is going to be completely blown apart at the turn of the century. I can't, I'm not going to give you like detailed uh, examples of scientific theories. If we're in class, I'm sure somebody who is a science major could do that for us. So please email me if you have any ideas. But um, what's happening is we're moving away from this belief in kind of objective and empirical knowledge toward the subjective experience and subjective um, perception. So like I said, I think modernism is really concerned about perception and about knowledge. So as our ways of seeing or ways of understanding the world are being undercut, 
artists are seeking new ways of depicting subjective perception and experience rather than like through objective knowledge. So we can see this as like a rejection of realism. I'll talk more about that when we get into modernist prose um, rather than poetry, but we are rejecting the tenets of realism. Okay, so I have a few more things to show you. Again, I... So um, I'm gonna move my video or my little picture here. So. I think a way to kind of understand how things were, how we were moving from kind of this attempt at objective and empirical knowledge to subjective experience is to look at the visual art that was happening in the 19th century and then look at what happened in the 20th century. So here we can see one landscape and one portrait, um, both gorgeous paintings, both really kind of uh, vibrant in in some ways um, so this is kind of representative art American art from the 19th century so let's think about what this suggests or what set this says about how people are seeing the world at that time and then compare that to um, paintings from the 20th century so there was a major artistic um, event in 1913 and this is the Armory Show and this is the first kind of major exhibition in America of some of the new artistic movements that are happening in Europe things like cubism and um, uh, so people like Matisse and Picasso um, who are breaking the rules of art from the 19th century and trying to discover new ways to depict um, to depict reality. So you can see these two pictures here. One is a portrait of a woman, um, and if we look back at the one before, like this is a quite quite a different experience or picture of this woman. So this is a Matisse painting. Um, so the color is vibrant, but we also can see kind of the workings of the painting we can see like the brush strokes so part of what's happening in modernism is we're seeing um, how things are made there's a new attention to the kind of the movements and the how of of things not just what it's depicting um, so we're looking at the painting not just through the painting um, and then this other one this kind of really interesting geometric painting is actually called Nude Descending a Staircase. So what it's trying to do is depict in one painting um, a, a, an experience of movement. So again, we're thinking about subjective perception, subjective experience. And so they're, they're trying to discover new ways or trying to create new ways of depicting that reality rather than objective reality. Um, here's another couple paintings. We have a Van Gogh, this one. We have a Picasso. Again, um, if you think back to the landscape from the 19th century, this Van Gogh painting is quite different. It's still landscape, but look at the use of color and the way it's expressing something different um, rather than just the desire to, to show... Um, it's expressing emotion in a different way than the, the just kind of the depiction, the objective depiction of a landscape. And then again, we have another portrait. It's quite different than the portrait uh, we saw before. So Picasso, Van Gogh. Okay, so thinking, kind of moving to poetry. And as we kind of make the analogy between the painting and the poetry, Poets, like those painters that we just saw, were trying to find new ways of depicting subjective experience and engaging with the modern world. Okay, so this um, motto, make it new, is this kind of modernist motto, right? You're trying to make a poetry that works for the modern world, that is new and depicts subjective experience, subjective perception in um, novel and vital ways. Okay, so what is new? Well, the forms are new, the subject matter, the stylistic choices, 
the language. So we're mostly working in free verse here. We're not following um, the metrical pattern of like the da 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 da. So we're not doing the kind of iambic pentameter um, rhythm. It's a rhythm based on talking. So this idea of um, trying to use the language like the people use that regular, not necessarily regular people, but that's used in um, in speaking. So it's it's going to be a natural rhythm rather than a um, rhythm that conforms to the the beats of say like the meter. Um, so there's lots of innovation and experimentation. They're going to be using line breaks differently. They're going to be visually um, depicting the poem on the page differently. So there's lots of new things happening. Um, and then a lot of remaking the past. So taking ideas, taking allusions, taking um, things from the past and putting them into the modern world. So think about like a James Joyce Ulysses, which is a retelling of the Odyssey in the mo a modern context. Um, but let me say this specifically about modernist poetry. So while they're all trying to kind of create something new, um, and that there are these kind of schools of thought within poetry, each individual poet, especially the poets that we read, their projects are very individual. They have a distinctive project. While they're responding to the same problems, responding to the same questions, um, it's different for each individual poet. And so next I'm going to kind of move into um, William Carlos Williams and talk about his project. Who is he? Let me stop here and say this. Um, this will be on Canvas, so I might be going kind of quickly, but you can always return to this PowerPoint. So just make sure you know that, okay? Good. All right. We're 22 minutes in. I'm going to kind of move quick. Here we go. All right. Let's go. So who's William Carlos Williams? So his kind of major poetic project, what did he think poetry should be? Well, first of all, poetry should be first and foremost American. So he was actually very against these poets and writers who moved to Europe during the 20s to try to gain some kind of new, new kind of freedom. He was very much about staying in America and creating a kind of American poetry that could work for the American people, as well as a American poetry that could help the American people deal with the issues of the modern world. All right, so poetry should be American and it should be modern. And we'll look at that, we'll look at what those that means for William Carlos Williams. His style is very simple and direct, and he uses a very simple, direct language and form. So Marianne Moore, um, who's a poet I love, calls his, his language plain American speech which cats and dogs can read. Okay, you might have to, you'll probably have to look up some words, probably in 2LC, there's some, I think, some difficult words um, or some words that we don't use anymore. But for the most part, you can read a, an, um, a William Carlos Williams poem and understand it. Uh, get what the words are meaning. Okay, so it's another thing with William Wall Stevens. We'll get there on uh, next week or m next video. Um, so simple, direct language and form. And I think something like Red Wheelbarrow is often anthologized at, because it really shows that off. It really shows William Carlos Williams at his most direct. Okay, um, imagism. So he's kind of connected to the uh, movement known as imagism, and I'm not going to get totally into that, but what he does is focus on immediate surroundings, and he has highly visual descriptive poetry. So he's really looking at kind of the, the he's really looking to describe, but also to create visual poetry. So a lot of his imagery is based on uh, visuals, what you see, okay? And then there's this emphasis on things and stuff and their worth outside the capitalist economy. So this is part of what he's trying to do in the kind of modern American context is to show things and their value outside of just um, their exchange worth. Okay, 
So there's my, he's also a poet of place. So one thing that's really interesting about William Carlos Williams is he was born in Rutherford, New Jersey, and he died in Rutherford, New Jersey. So he spent his whole life in this like kind of suburb, um, smaller city. So he is really concerned um, with and attending to the local and the common. So he wants to kind of return American poetry to the local, to the common, okay? So he was actually trained as a doctor. And so he was a doctor who was traveling to houses, doing house calls. He was, um, he was, uh, delivering babies. So he often worked with women. So a lot of his poems, a lot of his writing depict these common people. I think we can see that in something like To Elsie. Um, so he's really concerned with this. And why is he concerned with the local and the common? Well, because he believes that in the modern world, individuals are disconnected from land and community. So he wanted to recognize the U.S. culture's failure to attach values to the realities of the American environment, to the, to the land, and build kind of community based on the land. So um, he, was, he was very critical of something like colonialism that saw the American landscape as a blank canvas, right? That only just, that creates an American identity based on greed, is how he understood it. So he was trying to kind of find new ways to create community or to develop community based on um, a true experience of the land and true connection with the land. Which is interesting because he's living in a suburban context which everything is very built in a certain way. Um, so that's something to consider, think, think about. Okay, these are ideas that I want you to consider as you read the poems for the first time. So I want you to stop, press pause right now. Now I want you to just go read the poems. Get a, like your initial experience of what the poems are, what they're doing, what they're saying. This can be just like your first or, or two, maybe two read throughs. Uh, so press pause now, and then when you come back, we'll dig a little bit deeper in the poems so that you can, when you return to the poems, you can do a little bit more work there. Okay, so now I'm going to do a little bit of work on each poem. So I have my book handy, um, and we're going to... I want to just kind of give you some avenues, give you some entry points into the poems. I know that poetry is not easy. Um, I think William Carlos Williams is more accessible, but these these poems are, you know, confusing at times. And I think it's okay to be confused. What I want you to do, I, re I want you to remember um, the practices that we talked about. So um, the kind of four part movement through a poem or four time movement through a poem. So please practice that, continue to practice that. I think we can get something really interesting out of these poems. So let me first start with Spring and All. There, this is a really interesting poem. There's a lot going on here. So let me first place us. Where are we? What, what um, location? is William Carlos Williams putting us in. So there's this term called terrain vague. Um, basically, it's just a vacant lot. A terrain vague is a vacant lot. So he says, by the road to the contagious hospital under the surge of the blue mottled clouds driven from the northeast, a cold wind. Beyond the waste of broad muddy fields, brown with dried weeds, standing and falling patches, of standing water, the scattering of tall trees. So what we can imagine is there's this vacant lot, we're standing here, we're in this kind of um, unkept terrain, right? Um, so I have a picture here that you can kind of look at and think about and um, to try to place you. And 
I think the way we know that we're in more of a city or urban context is that we're on the road to the, the hospital. So we're maybe on like the outskirts of the city, but we're in a place that needs a hospital. So we're in a kind of more of an urban environment. Okay, the other kind of background or a little bit of background I want to get, give you for this poem is something called the Reverdi tradition. Um, literally, Reverdi means re-greening. So re-greening, well, it's a, it's a poem um, about the arrival of spring. So this poem is a Reverdi poem. Uh, the tradition of the Reverdi was um, very romantic, a, a tradition that really um, celebrates the return to spring. Um, so it's interesting to think that Williams is invoking this tradition. He actually mentions spring. So in the one, two, three, fourth stanza, he says, lifeless in appearance, sluggish, days spring approaches so we know spring is coming so we're in that kind of moment that transition moment that liminal space between winter and spring okay um so here we we know where we are time wise then so we've figured out where we are location wise we know we're time wise but also by talking about the return of spring, the regreening of earth, he place, places us in this long tradition of poems, of music, of art that is about the return of spring. So what is he doing here? Well, I think he's revising this for a modern urban moment. So how do you see this poem as a kind of modern or urban Reverdi. How is it an urban regreening, and is that a celebration still? Um, so think about that. Okay. Um, again, I want you after we kind of talk through these things in the poem, I want you to go back to the poem, even maybe pressing pause between each of the the my discussions of the poems, so that you can go back and reread. Some other things that I want you to pay attention to: the imagery. What kind of picture of spring is he offering? So actually visual, visualize the scene. So the surge of the blue mottled clouds driven from the Northeast, that's an amazing visual image of what do the clouds look like? What is the weather? What does he suggest about the weather in that imagery? Mm -hmm. I love this too. The, um, so we're in this vacant lot and it says along the road, the reddish purplish forked upstanding twiggy stuff stuff of bushes and small trees with dead brown leaves under them, leafless vines, right? So much visual stuff happening here. I think he's putting us into a kind of lot with this kind of scruffy grass that grows through cracks and kind of survives even in the midst of this urban environment. So think about the imagery, what's really interesting going on there. Um, the other thing I want you to think about is the relationship between growth and decay. And what, how does spring kind of sit in the middle of those things? So we know it's muddy. We know there's standing water. There, there seems to be kind of no life. But at the same time, spring approaches. So it says lifeless in appearance, sluggish in days. So it might appear kind of decaying, spring approaches. So they enter the new world, naked, cold, uncertain of all save that they enter. So there is this kind of movement, um, but it's a growth that we don't necessarily see. So what's the relationship between growth and decay in this poem? And what is he trying to say? Um, what is he trying to suggest? Maybe about mo the modern moment, okay? Um, lastly, one way you can always read a poem is it could, it can be a poem about poetry. So think about this as a poem about modern poetry. How is spring reflective of a new kind of art this spring, um, of the new kind of art that William Carlos Williams wants to see in the world? in America. Okay, think about that. All right.
Good. So spring and all. Of course, like always, you can email me any questions about specifically about these poems or anything else going on. Um, I do think they're pretty amazing poems, so hopefully you agree. Okay, to Elsie. I think this is our most complex poem for the for the day. Um, and this is, I would call, William Carlos Williams' great poem about the disconnection from the land and cultural traditions. The kind of American culture that has separated itself from um, the, the, the land. What he actually talks about peasant traditions here. So a kind of rural lifestyle that is embedded and connected to the land. This is a depiction of American culture that has been completely disconnected from that. Okay, so it's not a happy poem, right? It's a pro pretty um, depressing poem. I don't know, you can decide. Um, so that's the major theme here. So I think that even just having that can help you go back to this poem and try to understand it more. I also see that there's like a three part structure. So he's not using punctuation in this poem. So it can be hard to know when he's kind of moving back and forth um, to different subjects. So I see this as a kind of three part structure and there is a like little bit of a narrative like quality to the poem. Um, so let me talk through that a little bit. So it begins with a depiction of general and mostly rural American population that is disconnected from the land and quote unquote the pre peasant traditions of American culture. Um, it's not a good picture, right? We're, we don't like what we see here probably, right? Um, death mutes, thieves, old names and promiscuity, devil may care men, young slatterns. Think about the terms that he uses to describe these people. What kind of weight does the term slattern hold for describing young women? Okay, so think about that. Um, so at the word unless, and it's actually capitalized, which is interesting. So there's a dash and then there's unless. So we kind of, we move from this general depiction of the American population to a focus on Elsie, who becomes an individual symbol for this disconnection. Um, so gives us who she is and describes her. Um, one thing I want you to think about is how does he describe her? What does he focus on? What's interesting going on with Elsie as a character in this poem? Um, is she a specific person? Okay, I'll get to that more in just a second. And then it kind of moves to, um, when it says the truth about us, kind of moves to another depiction of isolation. So we get this kind of sense at the beginning of this rural population, we focus in on Elsie, and then we kind of move to the voice of the speaker and kind of the voice maybe even thinking about how the reader is included in that. Um, and then this depiction of isolation at the end. Again, we'll get to the end in a second. So one just kind of general question, what kind of picture of American society is Williams offering? That's a way to kind of entry point into this poem. What is he showing us about the modern American society? What has been lost? Um, and what kind of things are we missing? Things to think about, Elsie, who is she? What does she look like? What does he focus on? It seems like he's really focused on her body in an interesting way. Um, what does she express? What truth does Elsie express? An um, important question for this poem is, is Williams depicting Elsie in a sympathetic way? Is he exploiting her to try to prove a point? Is this even a specific person or does he you know, just see her as a symbol? And is that problematic? Um, and this poem's called To Elsie, but how is it to her? Because Elsie probably can't read. And if she can read, it probably is, this poem is not something that she would pick up for fun, right? So how is it to her? Um, how is it addressed to her and what significance does that bring? 
The ending. What is the imagination desire when it's straining after a deer? What does that suggest? What does that symbolize? And then why bring in the car? What's like, here's this piece of modern technology that gives us a new way of seeing that actually in other poems, Williams celebrates, right? The, this new depiction of how we see. But here it seems like a vehicle of separation somehow, a vehicle of lostness, of just kind of driving down this highway and having no, um, no, nothing to hold on to, right? No one to witness or adjust, no one to drive the car. Ooh, that's just like a gut punch. Um, so why bring the car to the end? And then what kind of picture of modern American life does the ending offer? So what is it trying to say? to us, or what is he trying to suggest? Okay, to Elsie. If you have questions, please let me know. Uh, I think this is an amazing poem. It's a kind of complex poem, so do your best. You guys will do great. Lastly, um, The Red Wheelbarrow. Really simple poem, but deceptively simple. One question that you can think about, is this an artistic answer to To Elsie? So is this a kind of art that gives us a depiction of American life that is connected to the landscape, is connected to community, to the land? I don't know, maybe. What do you think? Is there enough there for it to, to function in that way? Some things I want you to pay attention to with the red wheelbarrow. The specificity of the visual image. So it's not just a wheelbarrow, it's a red wheelbarrow. And it's also glazed with rain. And it's beside the white chickens, right? So the visual, it's placing us at the specific place. It's giving us this very specific image of the red wheelbarrow. But at the same time, there's a kind of abstractness to the time. When is this happening? Is this atemporal? Um, what does that mean uh, for the poem? Okay, and this is the big question for this poem. Williams writes, so much depends upon dot, dot, dot. Well, so much of what, right? What is this so much? It's kind of functioning as in some ways a pronoun, but it's hard to know what the so what is. Why begin with this abstract statement when everything else is so specific, when we have this really specific depiction of a red wheelbarrow? What is he trying to accomplish? I don't know, right? It's up to you. Okay, um, so what's gonna happen now? There are discussion questions up on Canvas that I have assigned. So there's five people for each discussion question. You need to write 200 words based on that question. Hey, it's probably about some of these questions that I had us thinking about to go back and read the poems in this video. Okay, this is a long video. They will not all be this long, I promise. Um, we just had to get a lot done today. I hope it all makes sense. And um, let me know if you have questions. Please, please, please let me know if you have questions. Um, this is right trial and error. We're figuring things out together. So William Carlos Williams, modernism, poetry, lots happening. This will be on this PowerPoint will be on Canvas. You can come back to it. Let me know if you need anything. All right, have a great day. Bye.